The Isle of Lost Skulls quest is one of the longest and hardest quests that Requiem has to offer, so much so that they actually offer you checkpoints to help you make your way through. If you have found your way to this video, first of all, hi, but you're probably struggling with the quest and are in need of some assistance. In this video, I'll guide you through everything that you need to know to get through this quest. The Isle of Lost Skulls has more weapons than your average Requiem quest, which is insane considering it's an experience that lasts roughly an hour. If you can see it, you can probably use it as a weapon, which is why so many of us have fallen in love with this quest. The weapons are split into three categories, melee, ranged and projectile, all of which have benefits that I will go into detail about. One of these weapons is the cutlass, which is best used at close ranges, although you can throw it if you need to, however I wouldn't recommend throwing it because you can't guarantee that you'll get it back. They're usually dropped by swashbuckler skeletons, although they can also be found throughout the entire quest, from beginning to end. They have a durability of 5, meaning they can only be used 5 times and does 1 damage point per swing. They're a good start to weapon and you find they're quite common around the entire place. Believe it or not, but you can actually use a stall as a weapon. It's great for blocking attacks from enemies and is one of the best tools to use for blocking bullets from skeletons and pistoliers. Unfortunately, they have a very low durability, but do 2 damage points when thrown, so it balances out quite nicely. Another tool you can use as a weapon is a broom, which is used similarly to a spear, focusing on longer range melee strikes. Unfortunately, they also break easily after 3 strikes, and they only deal 1 damage point to enemies, making it pretty useless, but yet again, it is just a broomstick. For some reason, you can also use a fish as a weapon, but who am I to compare about such a powerful weapon? I'm pretty sure they have infinite durability, although this fact may be wrong because I had to get this on from the Rec Room Wiki, which is quite inconsistent. They also do 1 damage point per swing, which is a good deal if you ask me. They will be found hanging from the ceiling in the kitchen, and can be found in the water stage. Another weapon found in the kitchen is the pan, which is a very short range, but is able to deal 2 damage points and hit enemies 5 times before breaking. This makes the pan one of the best weapons that you can find in the entire quest but are unfortunately very sparse due to that fact. One of the worst weapons can be found near cannons and in caves, and that is the torch. It does very little damage, taking a few hits to kill an enemy, and isn't very good for blocking either. However, it can be used to light the fuse on a cannon, allowing it to fire. Bottles are thrown by bottle skeletons, and can be found all throughout the quest. They can be thrown at most of the enemies that you'll encounter, and break on impact, dealing one damage point. Jugs are another throwable item that can be found all throughout the quest. They can also be thrown by jug skeletons, and are extremely lethal to both you and the enemy due to them dealing friendly fire damage. They are very similar to bottles in the way that they behave. The only difference is that these ones are explosive. The explosion itself deals one damage point. However, if it's a direct impact, it will deal an additional damage point. Plates can be found in the kitchen, and they also smash an impact. They can be thrown far like a frisbee, but only deal one damage point. You may also stumble upon a mug, which can be found predominantly in the bar area, as well as in many different areas around the entire quest. The act and deal the same damage as a bottle would. They're pretty much just a reskin. You can also throw coconuts found in the town to deal one damage. They also have an explosive variant that is thrown by gibbeted skeletons, which takes four seconds to explode. During this time, you can pick them up and throw them at any enemy you want, dealing one damage point to whatever is in range. One of the best weapons in the game is the flintlock pistol that is dropped by skeleton pistoliers or found commonly in the areas after the beach zone. Before you can do anything, it will need to be cocked. This is done by flipping the switch on the side of the pistol, or flipping it around in the air. The weapon can also be fired twice before you have to grab a new one. Usually, the weapon will two-shot most enemies, so that a headshot is an instant kill. You can also find cannons in ships. Unfortunately, they have a small turning radius, but the explosive cannibals may cut for that, dealing high amounts of damage to whoever gets in its way. In order to fire them, you'll need to use a torch found next to them and light the fuse. You can aim them by grabbing and moving them either left, right, up, or down. The blunderbuss deals significantly more damage than its flintlock counterpart, and is able to be fired up to 3 times before running out of ammo. The only downside is that it's most effective at a short range, kind of like a shotgun. The first enemy that you encounter will be the swashbuckler skeleton, and they will attack you with a cutlass. In order to defeat them, you'll need to block their strikes with a melee weapon of your own. Doing this will stun them and give you a chance to fight back. In my experience, these guys are the most common enemy, especially in the first few levels. Due to their melee based nature, their weaknesses include being shot with a ranged weapon, like a flintlock, or having something thrown at them like a stool. By doing this, you should be able to defeat them with ease and collect their cutlass. Another enemy that you'll run into is the Bottle Thrower. As the name suggests, they are a ranged enemy who uses bottles as their main weapon. On their own, they're easy to defeat, but when they're in groups, they can become a real handful. Though. Fortunately, you can block these bottles with a melee weapon, but skilled players will be able to grab the bottles straight out of the air and throw them back at them. A return to sender has never hurt anybody, right? I mean, unless you're on the receiving end of it. 
The juggler is very similar to the bottle thrower, but with lethal explosives instead of empty bottles. Despite this, they can still be blocked with a melee weapon or caught in midair. Even one on their own is enough to cause complete devastation for you and your team. Because of this, you should deal with them as quickly as possible and by any means necessary in order to avoid a quick and painful game over. Pirate captains are another dangerous foe to be found in this quest. They would fill lock pistols and have infinite ammo whilst also having great aim even from a distance. Seriously, it feels like these guys have aimbots or they're professionally trained snipers. The amount of times I've been sniped by one of these guys is absolutely ridiculous. Luckily, they take quite a long time to reload between shots, so that gives you enough time to find out where they are and shoot back. You also encounter an enemy known as the Gibbeted Skeleton, which is trapped in a cage and can only take explosion damage. Coincidentally, they also throw coconut bombs at you, which will be thrown back at them to damage them instead. You can also use jugs as a substitute if needed. However, nothing's better than a return to sender like I said earlier. You will also run into some cannoneers during your adventure, and as the name suggests, they will shoot you with cannons. The cannibals are highly explosive and have a wide area of effect. This means that one well-placed cannibal can wipe your entire team, so be careful and make them the priority. The final enemy you run into is Deadbeer, who is the final boss on the final stage. The main attack is a large cannonball with a wide hit radius. Seriously, most of the time it doesn't even look like he hit me, but never mind that. In order to defeat him, you have to use the cannons at your disposal and hit him three times, while spreading off waves of enemies after each hit. After this, your prize awaits you. The difference between gold and points is something that Rec Room does not explain to you, so let me do that instead. The quest introduces you to new systems known as gold, which is a currency that acts independently from tokens and the points earned in the quest. During each run, each player is limited to 1,600 gold each. Even if you pick up more, you'll not be able to exceed the cap. Now, you're probably wondering, how on earth do I even get gold in the first place? Well, it's simple, really. When exploring, you'll run into chests that you can open to get gold, and through the use of glitches, some players have been able to exploit them for infinite amounts of gold. This is most likely why the cap exists, if I'm going to be completely honest with you. If you get a game over with said gold, it will remain where you died, ready to be collected again in the next round. Now, time to address the elephant in the room, points. Points are invisible stat in Isle of Lost Skulls that determines your rank, and your rank determines what reward you get at the end. When you get down, you lose these points, however, you can gain points by defeating enemies throughout the entire quest. If you've made it this far, that's awesome, and I now hope that you are more knowledgeable about this quest and its mechanics. As always, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed it. That is always appreciated, and I will see you next time. See ya!